Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the January general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. It is fantastic to have you all here with us on Zoom this evening, and we have an excellent uh, guest speaker. Uh, but first, I wanted to mention uh, or tell you, because maybe you're curious, why are we meeting on Zoom again when we were back to in-person meetings as of uh, September? And there are many reasons that went through my head. Uh, and I'll kind of list them for you. Number one is our speaker is uh, via Zoom. So I figured, what the heck? Let's just not, let's just all meet via Zoom then. Number two, when I made the decision to uh, meet via Zoom, my entire family, for the most part, had COVID except for me. So I figured maybe COVID's really on the rise, which it is. So I thought maybe we should uh, just kind of wait it out a month and uh, meet on Zoom in January. And I was afraid maybe the weather would be bad. Uh, but really, the absolute main reason we were meeting on Zoom this month is because, frankly, I felt like it. <laughs> uh, so um, we did talk about it at the board meeting, but even if everyone was kind of saying, oh, I don't know, Rich, I think we should meet at camp. <laughs> nah, nah, we're going to meet on Zoom. So uh, without further ado, we're going to do the Zoom format and jump right to the speaker. We'll do the president's report afterward. So tonight's guest speaker is an education and outreach scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And there she works to support outreach efforts for the James Webb Space Telescope. Perhaps you've heard of it. She has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Toronto. She has made numerous local and national media appearances to talk about everything from the 2012 Mayan apocalypse to the super blue blood moon. You probably talked about how uh, Mars does not ever appear as big as the full moon either. We used to get that a lot. We don't, we don't get that too much anymore. She has also served as the coordinator of the McGill Space Institute, taught physics at Gazanga University. Is that a real thing? Gonzaga, you may have heard of their basketball team. Okay, and and help build the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Kelly Lepo. Okay, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm going to go share my screen here. Great, and I will start my timer. Um, hopefully that keeps me reasonably on time. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Kelly Lipo. I am an education and outreach scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And today we're going to talk about what the James Webb Space Telescope has been up to in the past year or so. Um, so I work here in this rather unassuming looking office building on the campus of John Hopkins University. And it is from this building a couple floors above me uh, that operators control NASA's uh, next flagship observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, here they uh, get downlinks from the telescope, they check on the telescope's health, um, they send commands back up, they plan the whole observing schedule. So uh, STSCI, as we like to call it, is both the home of the science operation and the mission operations of Webb. We're also the home of the science operations of the Hubble Space Telescope, so we get to decide what Hubble observes. And we're home to the MAST archive, which is an archive of a lot of the data from many different space telescope missions. Uh, but they don't let me uh, do the fun things like control the telescope, but they do let me uh, talk to people just like you all about the science and engineering of Webb. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to discuss how Webb came to be, a little bit about why we want to study infrared light in general, uh, and then we'll talk about Webb's exciting science and the things that it has discovered in the couple months that it's been in science operations. It still sounds weird to say that. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, we'll start off by a little bit of a background, how Webb came to be. Uh, so for me, uh, being an elder millennial, the 1990s were a very formative time, and that was also a very formative time for space telescopes. Uh, so the Hubble Space Telescope was launched 
in 1990, Hubble is primarily a visible light telescope, but it also sees a little bit of UV and a little bit of infrared light. Then in 1999, the Chandra X-ray Observatory was launched, um, and that is still going strong today. And in 2003, the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched. It's an, another infrared telescope with a much smaller mirror uh, compared to Webb. And sadly, its mission was over in 2020, so RIP Spitzer. So together, these great observatories gave us lots of different windows into the universe. And every time you look at the universe at a different wavelength range, you learn different information. So starting on the upper left here, we have an image of the Crab Nebula as seen by Chandra. What we have here is a neutron star, a pulsar, a star that is about the mass of the sun, but the size of, say, Baltimore, um, which is spinning very rapidly. And it has these enormous, gigantic magnetic fields surrounding it. And what we're seeing here is little charged particles spiraling around these magnetic fields and emitting X-ray light. Uh, then moving over one to the right, we have Zeta Ophiuchi, as seen by Spitzer in the infrared light. This is a massive star with very strong winds that is moving rapidly through a surrounding cloud of gas and dust, and it's creating a shock front as it uh, moves along. It's called a bow shock, like a bow travel, a boat, sorry, traveling through the water. Um, then uh, moving down one and to the left, we have the Ring Nebula, which is a planetary nebula, as seen by Hubble in visible light. So as you're probably aware, planetary nebulas don't have anything to do with planets. They're actually the dying gas of a star like our sun, which is very gently blowing off its outer layers. Uh, and then if we Captain Planet it and we combine all of their powers together, we have a multi-wavelength image of the antenna galaxies. So these are two galaxies which are merging together and it's triggering star formation. Um, so in infrared light, we can see the gassy, dusty areas where these new stars are forming. Uh, with visible light, we're seeing the sort of normal middle-aged stars. And then in x-rays, we're seeing the very hottest end products of stellar evolution, uh, neutron stars and x-rays and x-ray binaries. Uh, but perhaps the most consequential image to come out of this great observatory period is this, or at least something like this. So this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field taken in 2014. It is a successor to the original Hubble Deep Field, which was taken in 1995. Actually, right around this time of the year, the last couple of days of 1995, uh, the folks at STSDI did something which was rather controversial at the time. They used their new fancy space telescope to point at an otherwise black, uh, blank patch of sky for about 10 days. And they saw something that looked a whole lot like this. The universe is full of galaxies. So almost every single point of light in this image is a galaxy. There are about 10,000 of them in total in the full image. There are a few stars. Uh, I'll give you a second to see if you can spot them. So the bright stars have spikes on them. So we can see one in the upper left and one in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and if we have a little bit more information, we can take this image, which is the entire three-dimensional universe compressed into 2D, and we can spread out the light a little bit more, and we can make a flip book of galaxies over time. We can study galaxies nearby to us, which look sort of how you would expect we see spirals and ellipticals and structure. And then as we go back in time, galaxies start getting weird. They start getting smaller, they start getting blobbier, and they start getting redder. So I'll explain the, the redder bit. It's because the universe itself is expanding. So galaxies emit most of their light in visible and UV wavelengths. And when light travels to us, light takes time to travel, it gets stretched by the expansion of the universe. So light that has been traveling to us for 13 billion years or so gets so stretched by the expansion of the universe that it gets stretched out of Hubble's wavelength range. So here are um, three telescopes selected very deliberately showing their wavelength range. So Hubble can see from a little bit of the UV through visible light 
and into a little bit of the infrared. Uh, Webb sees from the reddy orange side of visible light, sort of the same color as its mirrors, all the way into mid infrared light. And our friend Spitzer can saw from uh, the mid infrared into the far infrared. So if we want to study these these ancient galaxies, we need something that can see very faint things because these galaxies are far away and very small. So we need a big mirror, and we need something that can see infrared light. And so we knew this um, sort of, we had an inkling uh, when Hub before Hubble was even launched. So plans for the next generation space telescope began with a conference in 1989, one year before Hubble launched at STSEI, where I work. Um, and there were a few concepts for telescopes designed in the 90s. This is one from Northrop Grumman. Um, and it was really these series of Hubble deep fields and the Astro uh, 20 or the, the decadal survey in 2000, which really cemented uh, JWST as uh, a, a large infrared telescope with a segmented mirror as something that the astronomical community wanted to build. So construction on Webb began in 2002, and that included a lot of technological development that had to happen to make web possible and then only finished up its testing in 2021, shortly before it launched. Uh, so here is a representation of the final design of web. We see a couple features here, which you're probably familiar with. Instead of enclosing uh, the mirror in a tube, we're leaving it open to space, but we're blocking stray light and heat from the sun and the earth and the moon with this five layer sun shield. We also have these big, uh, arms which hold the secondary mirror, the little mirror in front of the primary mirror. And Webb's mirror is enormous at 6.6 .6 meters in diameter. So here we have images of the telescope on the ground with human for scale. Uh, it's made out of 18 hexagonal gold coated segments. And we also see that the mirror can fold up so that we can stick it on the rocket. Uh, and that's part of why we chose this, or we, the designers of the telescope, I wasn't involved at the time, uh, chose this hexagonal uh, shape. And gold was chosen because it's a very good reflector of light in the infrared. Uh, so I don't know what you were doing Christmas 2021. I was dressed up in my very fanciest pajamas with some mimosas, uh, watching this web launching from uh, the European spaceport near Kourou, French Guiana, on an Ariane 5 rocket. The rocket was the European contribution to the mission, which allowed European astronomers a certain amount of guaranteed time on the telescope. Uh, so this is our last view of Webb. Um, so everyone, right now, I'd like you to say goodbye, Webb. Good luck. I hope you take lots of really cool pictures. Um, and so we're seeing the underside of the telescope right now, and we're seeing the aftermath of the Ariane 5 launch, which was really super precise, a lot more than, than spec, which allows Webb to have more than 20 years of propellant on board. So we're seeing the underside of the telescope as it's folded up, and it's, we're seeing it very shiny. We're seeing the, the underside of the, of the sun shield. Um, so over the course of about 30 days, and I was following along online, just absolutely terrified that this wouldn't work, but it did. Um, so Webb uh, uh, unfolded its sun shield and deployed it. It extended the secondary mirror supports to hold its little mirror in front of its big mirror. And then it unfolded the wings of the telescope mirror. And then uh, through a very labor intensive process, uh, they aligned all of the 18 mirrors together so that they were working as one mirror instead of 18 separate mirrors. Um, so there is a hot side and a cold side to the telescope, and they're separated by this five-layer aluminum-coated Kapton sun shield, which are, is about two thousandths of an inch thick. It's sort of similar to a potato chip bag, I like to call it. Um, so the side that faces the sun, which has the solar panels and the star trackers and the communications equipment, is something like 260 degrees Fahrenheit or 125 degrees Celsius. On the other side, the cold side of the telescope, 
It's about minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 235 degrees Celsius. So huge temperature difference. And then the mid-infrared instrument needs to be even colder. So it has a special cryo cooler on board. It works like a very, very fancy refrigerator or air conditioner. And that allows the telescope to the, the MIRI instrument to get down to about seven degrees above absolute zero. If you're playing along at home, that is minus 447 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 266 degrees Celsius. Um, and there was some worry at first that the cryo cooler would introduce some jitter into the telescope. And we just heard at the first science with JWST conference that it is working better than we expected. And so that the telescope is very still, which is great. It allows us to do even more really cool science. Um, so you'll notice that Webb has this gigantic mirror. So why is it so big? Part of the reason is that we want to see very faint things. And the bigger the telescope mirror you have, the bigger the light bucket, the more photons you can collect, the fainter the thing you can see. But also, we were expect to have a Hubble-like resolution in the infrared. And so it turns out that the redder the wavelength you want, you want to observe, the bigger the mirror you need to have have the same resolution. So both Hubble in visible light and Webb in infrared light have about the same resolution, about uh, 0.1 arc seconds. Um, and it's actually very difficult to make a mirror that big. So in addition to being foldable, the hexagons allow the manufacturing of the mirror to be a little bit easier. Um, the uh, instruments live on the back of the telescope. There are three near infrared instruments, near spec, near cam, and nearest, and one mid infrared instrument, the one I was talking about earlier, MIRI, which has to be super duper cold. Uh, Webb is parked at the spot L2. It's about a million miles away from the Earth. Uh, and L2 is a special equilibrium point. It's a Lagrange point. There are, in fact, five of them uh, in the Earth Sun system. Um, and so it's a special equilibrium point between two massive things and one very small thing like a telescope. Webb doesn't orbit exactly at L2. It orbits around L2 in this big halo orbit. Uh, partially, that's because Webb is, in fact, solar powered. And if Webb was exactly at L2, the sun uh, would always be blocked by the Earth. And also, L2 is an unstable equilibrium point, which means if you nudge the telescope a little bit exactly at L2, it would tend to fly away. So we have to use a little bit of propellant to keep the telescope uh, in this orbit. And luckily, the injection into this orbit from the Ariane 5 rocket was so precise that we have more than 20 years of propellant uh, for the mission, which means that that's probably not going to be the limiting factor on the telescope. Something else will break first. And no, I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, if I did, I would probably earn a lot more money because um, I would have psychic powers or something. I don't know. Anyways, uh, we talked to Webb via the Deep Space Network. Um, it has three relay stations, one in California, one in Spain, and one in Australia. It is controlled by JPL, the same folks who do the Mars rover stuff. Um, and the light travel time to L2 is about five seconds. So it's five seconds to send uh, stuff up to Web and five seconds to get commands back down. Uh, the Nominally, we uplink twice a day um, with a maximum of about 28 megabits uh, per second. And that's so we get about 57.2 gigabytes of recorded data downlinked per day. Uh, this changes a little bit depending on the schedule of the other missions. For example, if Artemis is in the right position, they actually end up hogging a lot of the deep space network. So we have to wait until they are finished. But still not bad for uh, space Wi-Fi. Okay, so last we left off, Webb had traveled to L2, unfolded, unfolded itself, and aligned its mirrors. And here we have the first publicly released engineering test image showing that all of the mirrors were in fact aligned and working together. This image is diffraction limited, if that means anything to you. Um, and so we're seeing a bright star at its center, but 
Before we talk about the star, I'd like to talk about the background a little bit. So you'll notice lots of different points of light there. And almost every single one of those points of light is a galaxy. In our engineering test image, we have taken an accidental deep field. Um, and if you actually zoom into this image, and I did when it first came out and got really excited, you can see some little adorable spiral arms on some of these galaxies. But let's go back to the bright star in its center. You'll see that it has these very characteristic spikes. And remember, we were looking at that Hubble deep field, and I said the bright stars are spiky. Um, and so whenever you have a telescope made with mirrors, you'll have diffraction spikes. Um, Webb's particular pattern comes from two things. Number one, the shape of its mirror. Um, so if you have a mirror that has sides, you basically get one spike per side. And so you get six spikes from uh, the hexagon. And then there's also spikes that are introduced by the uh, struts, which hold up the secondary mirror in front of the primary mirror. Those also have six points, but they're a little more flattened. Um, it reminds me kind of an X, of an X-wing. And so if you combine those two together, you get an eight-pointed star pattern because the engineers who designed Web deliberately designed these two diffraction spikes to overlap. Uh, and so this is how you can tell apart a Hubble from a Web image at a glance, count the spikes on the stars. Hubble stars will have four spikes. It has a round mirror, so you'll get an extended uh, circle in the middle, and then you'll get four spikes from the, the four struts which hold up the mirror. Webb will have eight spikes, uh, six big ones, and then two little ones. And we can see this diffraction pattern in the first science image that was released. Um, to This was unveiled by Joe Biden <laughs> for some reason. Uh, and here we have a bright star in the center photobombing our image of Webb's first deep field, SMAX 0723. Um, so we can see this characteristic spike pattern. This tells us this is a bright star. Beyond, behind that, we have this sort of white fuzzy thing, and that's the galaxy cluster. And the galaxy inside of this galaxy cluster, along with all of the dark matter between the galaxies, has so much mass that it's actually warping space-time. Uh, and so all of the galaxies that are behind the galaxy cluster, their light is bent and warped and magnified. It's sort of like looking through the bottom of a wine glass. And we deliberately point our telescope at these galaxy clusters for this phenomenon called gravitational lensing. So we get an assist uh, from uh, nature to see things that are even farther than what we could see without this extra help. The images are a little wonky. They aren't perfect uh, lenses, but you know, We'll take what we can get. So uh, this brings me to the next segment of the talk where we talk about why we went to study infrared light. Um, so as I was saying earlier, whenever you look at something with a different wavelength range of light, you get different information. So here we're looking at a picture of some meerkats and a freshwater crocodile. On the left, this is what they look like in visible light. And then on the right, we are looking at them with an infrared camera. So the meerkats themselves are, are glowing very brightly. They have cute little warm tummies, right? And then if we look at the freshwater crocodile, it's not glowing as brightly. The meerkats are warmer than their environment, and the freshwater crocodile is about the same temperature. So we get extra information when we're looking with infrared light. And you and me and the computer I'm talking into and everything that's about room temperature glows very brightly in infrared light. Um, but you might say, Kelly, space is not full of meerkats. And I will reply, yes, but space is full of dust. And by dust, I mean like dust, dust, like things that resemble sand and things that resemble soot, dust. So here we have what is perhaps uh, Hubble's most iconic image, the pillars of creation. And these are dark, dusty columns of gas and dust with baby stars forming inside of them. And we can't really see what's going on inside because dust is blocking our view. But uh, we can look now with web and we can look with near infrared light. And that allows us to see through the dust a lot more 
and see what's going on inside of the star forming area. We can see jets and shocks. The red areas on the, the tips of the pillars there are shocked hydrogen gas. And we can see a whole slew of stars in the background that we couldn't see before because our view was blocked by dust. And then if we look in mid-infrared light to even longer wavelengths of light, what we see is the dust itself is glowing. So if you want to see through dust or if you want to study dust, infrared light is the place to be. And the next uh, really important thing, as I was saying earlier, is the universe is expanding. Galaxies emit most of their light in visible and UV wavelengths. But if you want to see the first galaxies to form after the Big Bang in the first couple hundred million years, you have to look in infrared light. Um, so let's take a detour a little bit um, to talk about how web images are made, because I think a lot of people are curious about this. So uh, space telescopes are not quite uh, like a point and shoot camera. Usually what they do is they will take images through a series of filters. So here are the, the available near infrared filters for web. And the uh, X axis is the wavelengths and the, the Y axis is the throughput. So the amount of light that comes through each filter. So you can see there are very narrow filters and there are very wide filters and there are some filters that are sort of in between. And when we're making astronomical images like the one behind me, uh, what we do is we take grayscale images through a series of filters. We take the reddest filter and we assign it red. And we take the, the shortest wavelength filter, the bluest filter, and we assign it blue. And we pick one in the middle and we assign that green. And then often they'll, they'll pick out uh, a particular line of hydrogen and they might color that red as well. And you smush those all together and you get a representation of the actual real infrared data but changed to colors that we can see with our eyes. Um, so this is the Tarantula Nebula, a star forming area in the Large Magellanic Cloud, um, just sort of raw output out of the telescope. And then our very lovely image processors play around with the image a little more, adjusting the brightness and contrast and colors a little bit. And you get the press release image here. And if you're ever curious about what filters were used on any of our images, um, there will also be something called a compass image that is available. And down at the bottom, we list what filters correspond to what colors, if you're ever curious. And also the orientation of the image, if that is something that you're curious about. OK, and one final thing uh, before we get to the science. And that is to talk a little bit about spectra. So this is near and dear to my heart. This is what I did my PhD with. So uh, spectroscopy, if you're not aware, is taking light from an object and using something like a prism or a grism or a diffraction grating to split that light into its component colors. And what you'll see is something like a bright rainbow with dark bands or uh, bright bands on a black background. And these are caused by uh, different atoms and molecules, which each have a different signature. And astronomers can recognize these patterns uh, from looking at things on the ground, making laboratory measurements, and use that to compare to things in space. And we can learn about things uh, like the composition of the object, but also how fast it's moving, how dense it is, how fast it's spinning, and with a little bit more information, also how far away it is. So let's look at some, some real spectra from Webb. And this is the, the thing that got astronomers really excited on uh, first images day when I was there in the auditorium with them. And this is the spectrum of a little tiny red blobby galaxy whose light has been traveling to us for 13.1 billion years. And each one of the spikes in this um, spectrum correspond to different chemical elements. So we're seeing the signatures of oxygen and hydrogen and neon in this light from a galaxy, which is uh, very, very far away from us in the early universe. Um, another way this is useful is that um, something happens when you uh, order these galaxies by distance. So at the top, and apologies, it's a little small, um, we have a galaxy whose light has been traveling to us for 11.3 billion years. 
Um, and then on down in the bottom most galaxy has been traveling to us for 13.1 billion years. And uh, we've highlighted here some different spectral lines. And so these are the same lines. We see one line of hydrogen and oxygen doublet. So two lines of oxygen very close together and another line of hydrogen. And as the light has been traveling to us for longer, as these galaxies are farther away from us, we see these spectral lines shifting to longer wavelengths. We see them red shifting. And so when astronomers talk about redshift, this is what they mean. This is the gold standard for figuring out how far away a galaxy is by looking at the spectral lines and seeing how redshifted they are. Okay, so uh, we have enough background. Let's talk about some science. Uh, so time on web is decided um, through a, um, a proposal process. Astronomers, or anyone really, but in practice mostly astronomers, uh, write a proposal saying, I want to observe this object for this reason. And then a panel of peers review all of those proposals and pick the best ones to get telescope time. This is known as dual anonymous peer review. Um, so you don't put your name at the top. So it's really just selected for the best science. And since STSCI has switched over to this dual anonymous system, um, we're seeing more young astronomers and more women get time on the telescope. So that seems that we are reducing the bias in the proposal process um, to just focus on the great science. So here we have um, uh, the a pie chart showing the amount of uh, time on the first year of Webb uh, that is devoted in different categories, um, about a third to galaxies, uh, about 20% to exoplanets and their disks, about 12% to stars, and then smaller amounts to supermassive black holes, populations of stars, things in the solar system, and the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, so one thing that everyone is really excited about is using Webb to see some of the first galaxies. So this is Hubble's record holder. It's called GNZ11. It's located in the Goods North Field um, in the constellation of Ursa Major. And we're seeing it as it was about 400 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, there are a whole series of deep field studies that are going on right now with Webb. And each one of these uses different observing proposals. So the width of these blocks shows you how much sky that they're covering. And the color shows you how deep they're going. So the darker the color, the more time they're focusing on one particular spot. And so we have um, surveys that are going wide and shallow and surveys that are very concentrated um, and deep. And the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the image I was showing you earlier, is that little square in the bottom there. So some early results uh, from these surveys. Uh, so here is a press release image from the Sears survey, which is one of those surveys. They have a whole bunch of uh, cute little galaxies uh, there. This is the galaxy that they have seen, which is the furthest. Um, actually, or it was the furthest. I think they've actually found deeper ones. But this one is called uh, Macy's Galaxy after the, the principal investigator's daughter. Who, she asked that he name a galaxy after her, and how could he refuse? Um, this one is at a redshift of 11.8, which breaks Hubble's record. Um, and here is uh, another uh, group. Um, this is from, uh, well, okay, so the Jade survey is using a technique called the Lyman break. And what this is, if you look at the, the light from a galaxy, um, there, there comes a point in the rest frame UV where the light from the galaxy just drops completely off. And this is due to the surrounding hydrogen gas. So you can look for this feature where the light from the galaxy abruptly drops off, and that gives you a very good indication of its redshift. This is a, a, a marker that we can use to see how the observed um, spectrum compares um, to what we know of what galaxies do um, when they're not redshifted. Okay, so we can use this technique and we can find some very distant galaxies in the Jade's survey. Um, and so we have galaxies 
that are going up to a redshift of all the way up to 13.2, which is ridiculous. We weren't even sure we were going to find galaxies out this far, but there they are. Um, and so all of these are um, less than 500 million years after the Big Bang. So these are all record holders. We keep breaking the records of furthest galaxies, which is really exciting. Um, but it's not just distant galaxies. Webb observes nearby galaxies as well. Here is a, a really neat image of the, a cart, the cartwheel galaxy, which is named after the wheel of a cart and not the gymnastics move like I thought before. Um, but this is caused by um, a spiral galaxy that had a little galaxy slam right through its center. And so we see these, these spokes coming off. Um, and this galactic collision triggered a whole bunch of star formation. And the, the galaxy which slammed through it is now out of frame. But we can see in the center a whole collection of stars. And then on the outside, we're seeing glowing dust and uh, star forming areas. And actually, if you look at the bottom of this image, there is the first supernova that Webb observed right at the bottom there, which is pretty cool. Um, and here's another set of interacting galaxies. This one is called Stefan's Quintet. This is one of the first images that were released by Webb. Um, the four galaxies on the right are interacting with each other. The galaxy on the left is actually photobombing. It's a small galaxy, which is just happens to be aligned with the other big galaxies in the background. And you can tell that because you can actually resolve individual stars um, on the leftmost galaxy. Um, but what we're seeing here is this big soup of these galaxies interacting with each other. They're pulling off these big tails. There's a big shock front sort of at the top of the little smiley face area. And the top eye of the smiley face is what is known as the high speed intruder. This is a galaxy which is plowing into the other galaxies and creating this big shock front. Um, so this is a combination of near and mid infrared light. If we look with just mid-infrared light at the topmost galaxy, we see something, and that looks spiky. And I told you that spiky things are stars. But actually, this is a black hole. This is a point of light, which is why it looks spiky. And it's very, very bright. And we can only see it when we can see through all of the dust in mid-infrared light. This is what is known as an active galactic nucleus. It is a supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy. And that's something else that Webb really specializes in doing, seeing through the dust of nearby galaxies to look at their supermassive black holes. We can watch the gas and dust orbit around these black holes, and that's what is glowing, not the black hole itself, but the stuff very, very close to the black hole. And black holes also launch these jets, um, and the jets interact with the rest of the galaxy, um, and they can uh, turn on and off star formation, and it's this whole big interactive loop that we're hoping to understand by studying these galaxies with Webb. Um, Webb will be able to see through the dust to study our own resonant supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, and it can also study galaxies uh, in the early universe that have black holes known as quasars. Um, and there's this chicken and egg problem, which came first, black holes or galaxies. And maybe in the next few years, Webb will be able to help us uh, understand this question. Um, and again, how do we uh, measure these? We, we use spectra. Um, so we have these things called an integral field unit. We can take a spectrum of every single pixel or in the center of a galaxy, and we can um, see whether the gas is moving towards us or away from us. And we can use that to measure the mass of the black hole at the center of a galaxy. It's really cool. OK, um, another really important thing that Webb can do is study the life cycle of stars, the birth, the middle age, and the death of stars. Um, so this is a, a Hubble image of the Carina Nebula invisible light. We can't see through into these dark, dusty areas where stars form. But if we look with Hubble's limited infrared vision, we can see what's going on inside. So now we're going to look at the Carina Nebula, but with Webb. Um, so I'm going to start. This is a image from an amateur astronomer. It is a narrow band image of the Carina Nebula and with Eta Carina and the key to, Keyhole Nebula in its center. But we're going to go up to a little side pocket known as NGC 
3324. Uh, and we can zoom into that, and we can zoom into that again, and there we have the cosmic cliffs in the Carina Nebula, or at least very close to the Carina Nebula. Um, and so this is an active star-forming region. In the bottom half here, the, the mountain section, are these dark, dusty areas where new baby stars are forming. And then above that, we see the gas and the dust being evaporated by this big star cluster in the middle of that bubble that's just out of frame. Um, if we switch over to a slightly different set of filters here, this one um, highlights molecular hydrogen. We can start to see what those baby stars are doing. So the baby stars are very messy eaters, um, and they have all of these really beautiful outflows. We see them blowing jets, um, and we see them blowing these bigger outflows. And um, this area will, will give astronomers a lot to do for a really long time, trying to understand the star formation process inside of Carina. Um, so this image I just wanted to show because I think it's really beautiful. It's another, this is a slightly older protostar. Um, and so there's a line in the middle there, and that is the disk, a planet-forming disk surrounding the star at the very center. Um, and we can see that this star has blown out this, this um, hourglass-shaped nebula above and below it. And you don't actually see that many stars in the background, which is a little unusual for a web image. And that's because it's still embedded inside of its host nebula, and the, the nebula absorbs all of the light, so you don't really see anything. So we're seeing basically a, a flashlight shining up and down caused by this newly forming star. Um, okay. Oh, and also the colors here uh, correspond to how much dust there is. So the bluer areas have less dust and the oranger areas have more dust. Okay. Um, and it's not just the birth of stars that Webb will observe, it's also um, the, the end point of stars. So wolf ray stars are these massive O stars at the end of their lifetimes. They have very, very strong winds, and they're, the winds are so strong that they have basically blown off the outer layers of these stars, um, exposing the helium core of the star. And massive stars tend to form in binaries and in higher order multiples. So a lot of these wolf ray stars will have a companion. Um, and so when these two stars orbit around each other, both of these stars have stellar winds, the winds tend to collide with e each other. And at this collision point, they tend to form a lot of dust for reasons that we don't quite understand. But it seems to be the right density and the temperature to form dust, the same sort of dust that we were talking about, this hydrocarbon dust that was in the star forming regions. Um, so as these stars orbit around each other, whenever they, they get close by, they'll, they'll produce all of this dust. Um, so I was showing you a ground based image before. Here is a illustration of the, the a system like this in this is an actual image of the star Wolf Ray 140. Um, so we have two stars and they're orbiting around each other and only in certain points of their orbit do they uh, make dust. So that's why we're seeing, seeing these series of rings. It's actually 130 years worth of rings. We can count these like tree rings. And we're only seeing uh, arcs instead of full circles. And that is actually real. That's not just because only half is lit up. That's because in only part of the orbit are we forming dust. And then after that, they, these, um, these arcs kind of drift outward on the winds of the stars. And so the question before Webb was, does the dust created in this process actually survive or does it get destroyed? And it seems to be that this dust survives. So this might be where most, a sum of the hydrocarbon dust in the universe is formed in the colliding winds of binary stars at the end of their lifetimes, which is pretty cool. Um, so here is another uh, type of star at the end of its lifetime. Uh, this is a more sun-like star. And this also happens to be a binary system. So here we have the Southern Ring Nebula. It's another one of Webb's first images. On the left, we have near-infrared light. On the right, we have mid-infrared light. 
And only in these mid-infrared wavelengths can you see the star responsible for the nebula. It's the red one. The whitish one is a companion star. Um, and that's all you really see in the near cam image. If you if you squint, you can kind of see it. But, yeah. um, so here is a different view of the Southern Ring Nebula. Um, and this is a combination of uh, near and mid infrared uh, wavelengths. But here we're picking out different filters to see different things. So the one on the left is the glowing gas inside of the cavity being heated by these two stars. And on the outside, we see the structure of the outer layers of the stars that have already been blown off and they interact with each other and they create these really interesting structures and we have a little bit of light that, that pokes out and makes these rays coming off of it. It's There's all of these really cool details and it's this really complicated, beautiful system. Um, so a little closer to home, well, Webb is currently studying our own solar system. And this ends up being a little tricky, especially for something like Jupiter, because Jupiter is really stinking bright in the infrared and Webb has this giant mirror. And so we have to take these really short integrations to try to capture it. So this is an image of Jupiter in infrared by Webb um, as processed by amateur image processor Judy Webb. Uh, and we have lots of pictures of other things in our solar system. I like this one in particular. Um, this is the Neptune system. We have Neptune at its center. We have our best view of Neptune's rings since the Voyager probe came by and all of its other little moons. And then up in the upper left, we have something which looks like a star. It has spikes, but it is not a star. It is, in fact, the moon Triton. Triton is covered with nitrogen ice, and this is really, really good at reflecting sunlight. So Triton is stinking bright in the um, near infrared, and so we're, we're seeing this little jewel in the sky. Um, and here's another moon. This is Saturn's moon Titan, as seen by Webb. Um, so there's two different filter sets here. One is uh, concentrating on the upper atmosphere of the moon. So we're seeing clouds in the atmosphere and haze. Um, and then if you pick other filters, you can actually see surface features of the moon, which is really cool. It's covered in these hydrocarbon lakes and it's all covered in haze. And if you look at it in visible light, all you see is the haze, but we can see through it with Webb's infrared vision. And we can actually see clouds moving across the surface of Titan. Um, I don't have a picture for you, and I'm looking forward to seeing it because I know it exists, but it hasn't been publicly released, um, of Pluto. So here is our New Horizons image of Pluto and its moon Charon, our king of the Kuiper Belt. So Webb is, going, Webb is currently exploring the, the Kuiper Belt all of these icy red objects out there, including um, Pluto and uh, Eris and Sedna and Humea. Um, and so we're going to learn about all of these objects, what they're made out of, and all of the weird ices which happen at these very cold, distant temperatures. Um, and the last thing that I'd like to talk about is the science of exoplanets. So it's not just planets inside of our solar system, Webb helps us explore planets outside of our solar system. So this is a ground-based Keck image of the star HR 8799, or rather the planets that are orbiting around that star. So we blocked out the bright star with a disk called a coronagraph, so we can see the faint planets that are orbiting around this star. And it turns out that if you want to have the greatest contrast between stars, which tend to be kind of faint in infrared light, and planets, which tend to be pretty bright in infrared light, um, it, the infrared is the, the place where you want to look. Um, so this is a ground-based image. Here is um, Webb using a similar technique. So Webb also has a coronagraph on board. It can also block out the bright light from stars to see planets around them. So this is the exoplanet HIP 6542-6B. There we go. I hope I got that right. Um, and so the planet here is that little smudgy thing, and it's the planet is only a single dot. We're just getting a single point from the planet because it's so far away, um, and it gets sort of smeared out by the web's uh, optics, and it gets smeared out different amounts at different wavelengths. But you get the idea. We are seeing a planet around a different star. Uh, another technique that you can use 
is to not observe the planet directly, but observe it indirectly when it goes in front of its star, the transit method, which Kepler used um, to discover a whole bunch of exoplanets. Uh, so you can do something called transmission spectroscopy. Um, and we do this by watching uh, and waiting for the planet to pass in front of its star. And when it does, some of the starlight shines through the atmosphere of the planet, and the planet absorbs a little bit of that starlight. And that allows you to learn about what the planet's atmosphere is made out of. So this is an actual um, transit light curve of the planet WASP-96b. Absolutely beautiful. Um, you look at the, the light curves from um, Spitzer, they are not nearly this beautiful and pretty. So here um, we are taking chunks of that bit where the planet is absorbing light at different wavelengths, and we're seeing at this wavelength how much light is the planet absorbing at this wavelength, at this wavelength, et cetera. And we can make what is known as a transit spectrum of the planets, and we can use that to figure out what molecules are in the planet's atmosphere. And so we have these bumps, and each one of these bumps is a, a area of high absorption. And this tells us that there's water vapor in the atmosphere of this exoplanet, which is a thousand light years away. It's hot and puffy. It's, um, I think it's something like the mass of Saturn, but bigger than Jupiter, and it's orbiting in a three-day orbit. And we can tell that its atmosphere is full of water vapor, which is pretty cool. Um, here's another planet, WASP-39b, and we can play a similar game. We can watch uh, as the planet goes in front of its star, and we can pick out different colors of light and see how much uh, light that star is, or that planet's atmosphere is absorb absorbing. Ah. Um, so we can even by eye, if we separate this by color, um, see that the red light is getting blocked less and the green light is being blocked more. Um, we can do a little more sophisticated analysis of this. Um, and here we can see the detection of several different molecules in the atmosphere of this planet, including carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, water, um, and sodium. And we've actually observed this with all of Webb's different infrared spectrographs, and we're right in the process of trying to calibrate them together so that they make sense when we stick them all together. But for now, we have detected molecules in the atmospheres of these hot Jupiter planets, um, planets that are very massive but orbiting very close to their stars. Uh, but in the future, um, we're and these observations I think have already been done but not publicly released, we're going to learn about things like the TRAPPIST system. So the TRAPPIST system are seven rocky Earth-sized worlds that are orbiting an ultra-cool star about 39 light years from Earth. And this is close enough that we can point Webb and observe these planets as they go in front of their star, and we'll be able to understand the bulk composition of the atmospheres of these planets. Um, are they mostly nitrogen, like the Earth, or carbon dioxide, like Mars and Venus, or are they water vapor? Are they water worlds? Do they have no atmosphere at all, and they're just blank rocks? Um, so look forward to that. I mean, I am. I want to, I want to know what the Trappist planets are made out of. Um, so with that, um, I, that's all I have uh, for this evening. Um, so here are web science themes I'll leave you with. The life cycle of stars, the early universe, other worlds, planets inside and outside of our solar system, and galaxies over time. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lepo. Uh, that was fantastic. Let me uh, unmute, let, let everyone uh, uh, be able to unmute themselves, which you can do now. And if anyone would like to ask a question, go ahead. This is Rich wanting to go back to one of your very first slides showing that control room. So it has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, planetary and space stuff. But how do you protect that control room? It's got so many wind. Are those windows or screens? I couldn't make that out because you said upstairs and showed a multi-story above ground building. Uh, yes, it is. Um, so... A lot of control rooms are located in basements, um, and that's a little sad to spend 12 hours or whatever in a basement without seeing any sunlight. So they very deliberately put this upstairs, and it's facing this 
beautiful wooded area outside of the building. Well, what if? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, there's a backup control room. If anything happens to S TSCI, oh. there's a backup control room at Goddard. Okay, um, thanks. I didn't realize that. Itself. Yes. <laughs> Next question. I'll go. So uh, yesterday, yesterday there was a uh, an article about James Webb finding some Milky Way light galaxies uh, in the young universe. Can you talk about the significance of that? Oh gosh, I <laughs> I have not read that article um, mostly because there is a giant astronomy conference, which is next week. And so I've been, my brain has been 100% focused on that. Um, but yeah, I think the, uh, from like background, what I'm seeing on social media is something like we're seeing structure in the, the early universe, which means that, you know, our ideas of what the first galaxies are like might not quite be uh, what they are actually like. It's an exciting, time um because right we only had guesses before and now we have some real data that we can dig into my non-answer to that question oh well, it's very good non-answer thanks um i was wondering um earlier you had talked about how science projects observing projects were based sort of in a blind study of the project. And uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little more about who makes up the uh, group that looks into that and sort of what, I was just interested in the process of that. <clears throat> yeah, so um, astronomers or anyone, but you have to convince other astronomers, um, submit proposals. And um, you take your name off the top of the proposal and you just write about the science that you want to do. And then there are these um, panels which are uh, comprised of other astronomers. This is part of service work that astronomers do. They volunteer their time and they read through hundreds of proposals in their scientific area. And um, I think it's something like five-ish people, maybe 10, I don't know off the top of my head, um, so they read through these proposals and they rank them, um, and then the top proposals get time on the telescope. This is similar to how a lot of observatories allocate their time, um, but at STSCI we were um, we developed this dual anonymous system so that you don't um, put your name on the top of the proposal, so it's not uh, ranked by uh, uh, the name of the proposer, um, and also uh, we don't know who is the who's on the committee who's ranking you. Okay. I have a question. Have the first that lit up the uh, the you know the universe after the form you know formation of the universe after the Big Bang. How early back in time uh, do they, did they first light up? And where would you go to look to see them in, in uh, the expansive universe that we have now? Okay, so galaxies in the early universe. Um, okay, so uh, stars? Stars, stars. Yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, the, so the universe formed after the Big Bang. It was mostly hydrogen gas. It was really boring. Uh, and then something happened, and we think the first stars formed before there were galaxies. So were, they were these, um, we call them population three stars. There are these hundred solar mass giants that formed something like a um, uh, hundred uh, million years after the Big Bang. Although the timing on this is really uncertain. Um, Webb is probably not going to be able to see these first stars, um, but maybe. Um, and then after that, after that first generation of stars died, a second generation of stars um, was formed. And those stars are probably in the galaxies that we're seeing with Webb. Although this whole early universe timing thing is still very uncertain. So where would you go to look for that in, in the expansive universe that we live in now? 
Yeah, so one thing is these um, lenses. Remember I was talking about those gravitational lenses? Um, so these first stars are already dead. They lived very, very short lives. So the more massive the star you have, the faster it explodes. So those stars are all long dead, but um, we might be able to see hints of them in the early universe if we look at gravitationally lensed uh, objects or so using nature to help us out to see even farther back in time. So there's some hope that we'll see some of these first stars um, if we look very closely in these gravitational lenses. Haven't seen them yet. Is yeah, that's a that's a uh, fortunate thing that happens randomly. These gravitational lenses things are they is that because they're random are they uniformly distributed around the universe or it, is it like on the ecliptic plane or some you know other like uh, object? Yeah, so it's sort of randomly distributed. So galaxies are distributed in this cosmic web. So you'll have like. Um, spider web like clumps and, and hubs and that sort of thing. But yeah, so the universe is more or less, if you look on the biggest scales, uniform. Um, we tend to not be able to look out of the into the ecliptic plane and see anything because there's too much stuff in our own galaxy, um, in our own solar system. So we have to look out of the galactic plane, so above and below us. And then we're looking at these galaxy clusters to see the stuff behind them that might by chance be extra super duper magnified. One other question about the expansion. We know that the expansion is accelerating, but do we know if that acceleration is constant or is there a third derivative? Mm, um, that is a good question. <laughs> Um, so that I think is, gosh, I'm not a cosmologist, so I might get this wrong, but I think that is an area of active research. Um, yeah. and that is something like, if you look at the very early universe and you measure, um, the, uh, expansion, the accelerating expansion rate, and you look at the local universe and you measure the same rate, they don't quite match up. And we're not right. sure if that's because there's new physics happening or if it's because there's measurement errors. So it could be either one at the moment. Okay, thank you. It's interesting that some of your presentation mentioned that there are large exoplanets which are H2O based. And I read this in the past too, and they're very close to the sun, their sun, three day orbits or such. Why, why is there a theory as to why all the H2O has not been stripped from the planet yeah um so they're not they're not like a, a big ball of water they're more something like jupiter and they happen to have water vapor in their atmosphere and water vapor is really good at absorbing infrared light so that you'll see the signatures of that um and if you look at jupiter itself you'll also see water vapor in it um, so why have all of the water vapor as a volatile? Why hasn't it all boiled off if they're that close? Um, that is another good question. Um, and so we're just sort of now trying to understand the physics and chemistry of these atmospheres. Um, and it may be that they had more water in their past and it's slowly losing water over its lifetime, but it hasn't gotten rid of all of it yet. Makes sense. Thank you. Wonderful are, are presentation. People, are people looking for molecular signatures of life in the exoplanet atmospheres? And, and if so, what, what signatures are they looking for? Yeah, so um, people are, I don't, they're probably not going to find anything with Webb. Webb isn't quite big enough. <laughs> it has this giant mirror, but it's not, doesn't quite have the light collecting power to do this. So you want to find something that is not in equilibrium, something that only life um, could produce that you would lose too quickly otherwise. And so this is something that the next generation of um, space telescopes, I think they're now calling it the Habitable Worlds Telescope, is something that they're designing right now to be able to do this. Yeah, uh, very cool. Dr. Lepo, this Back to the is uh, question Richard from, from earlier. Uh, oh. Arizona. Uh, uh, how 
you, you mentioned the, um, the Hubble Deep Space picture. Um, how was someone allowed to get Hubble to spend you know, several days looking at nothing? It seems like it shouldn't have been possible. Aha, and that is where director's discretionary time comes in. So if you are the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, you have a chunk of time that you can award to whatever you want. And the director at that time decided that that was the best project to do. Um, so at the time, no one would have gotten through a proposal to do that because people thought it was a dumb idea. Um, but it turns out it wasn't. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have, I, I have a silly question. Many people may think this is a silly question. Maybe it's obvious to some people, but it's not quite obvious to me. How does the telescope point to different parts of the sky but keep the sunshade in the proper position so the telescope doesn't get fried. I've never seen an animation of how the telescope actually physically moves. Yeah, so the telescope is restricted. Um, so you can't ever point your $8 billion, $9 billion telescope at the sun. Right. Um, so you always have to keep it, the sun um, shield facing towards the earth and you can tip and tilt it a little bit in several different directions. Um, and there's gyroscopes on board that allows you to do all of this. And so right, right. Um, over the course of a year, you can cover the entire uh, celestial sphere, but there's only a certain portion of the sky that you can um, observe at any one time. So, for example, Webb can't point at the anti-solar point because it would have to turn too far, right? Exactly. Okay, I got it. You, you were talking uh, earlier, well, actually toward the end of your talk about the uh, looking at the atmosphere of, or the, doing the spectroscopy of the atmospheres of exoplanets. Is there any uh, way of doing that to uh, like planetary surfaces or something that the light wouldn't actually transmit through but would reflect off of? Yeah, um, so they do do reflection spectra of things inside of our solar system, things like comets and asteroids. Um, I think that measurement is a little too hard to do for things outside of the solar system. It's just too faint a signal to see. But I think if we can find some planets that we've confirmed that they don't have an atmosphere, maybe some people will try it. But to date, um, we're just exploring atmospheres. Okay, thanks. How is it possible that two galaxies collided if everything is getting farther away from everything else all the time? Like, is that super rare or is that a very common thing to see? Yeah, so galaxy galaxy collisions are fairly common. Um, so when I say everything is moving away from everything else, I mean uh, on the scale of bigger than galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters are actually gravitationally attracted to e the galaxies inside galaxy clusters are gravitationally attracted to each other, which is enough to resist the expansion of the universe. And so when you have two things that are bound together by gravity, they tend to orbit around each other and sometimes smash into each other. Um, and these galaxy clusters are relics of the early universe, these little pockets of overdensities, which eventually um, formed galaxies and galaxy clusters. And those are the biggest scale things in the universe. And so, yeah, galaxies um, tend to grow by eating other galaxies. And uh, that's what happened to our own Milky Way. And we can see evidence of this and the tiny little satellite galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way right now, and we can actually see streams of tiny galaxies that were pulled apart and are now uh, above and below the disk of the Milky Way. Any other questions? I want more pretty pictures. Uh, we They're have... <laughs> Uh, the Mars rovers, for example, have a raw image uh, place we can go see the latest imaging. Uh, is there some place like that other than the uh, NASA web blog, for example? What do you suggest? Yes. So there is the MAST archive and all of the raw data um, from all of the uh, missions, including JWST, is there. So if you want to um, go look at the raw data, there it is. And there's actually a whole 
army of uh, amateur image processors who go uh, scour the archive for all of the new stuff um, and can download that and put pictures out faster than um, the official NASA images. Um, the So there's different proprietary periods on uh, web data. Uh, some of the data has a one-year proprietary period on it for smaller programs. Um, a lot of the bigger programs, the data is public immediately as soon after it's taken. So that's mast archive, much like the mast. mast of a ship? Exactly. Yep. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, that, that's... Oh, go ahead. So, oh, sorry. I'm I'm curious how Kelly got interested in astronomy to begin with. Oh gosh, okay. So uh, we'll we'll go back to the 1990s when I was you know a child, and there was a local branch of Penn State, and there was a astronomy professor there, and he would give astronomy talks just like this um, once a month, and so I would go with my sister and and you know learn about black holes and get scared that black holes were going to eat me. And then afterwards, there'd be a little star party. Uh, and so that's what got me hooked. Uh, and then I stuck through all of the, you know, uh, physics and math classes and uh, to, to do a physics major and then a PhD in astrophysics. So, so from that point, you figured out that was what you wanted to, to do? Sort of. I, um, you know, I, I read that. You know, people always change their mind when they get to college. Everyone changes their college major. So I'm like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to, you know, do astronomy for as long as it's interesting. And then if I find something better, I'll do that. And here I am. <laughs> I never found anything better. Very nice. And great lecture, by the way. Thank you. Very good. All right. That seems like the perfect place to stop uh, with, with a little... Uh biography of Dr. Lepo. And I just want to say, uh, personally, I'm really glad you joined us. I'm glad you didn't hold a grudge because I bumped you in uh, June of 2021. Uh, some of you may know, I invited uh, Dr. John Mather, who, who's a senior project scientist of Webb. I, I emailed him twice, didn't hear from him, emailed Dr. Lepo, heard from her right away, then finally heard from Dr. Mather and realized this is probably our only chance to get him. And he even said when he accepted the invitation finally, uh, because we were in the middle of the shutdown still, you know, there's nothing better to do on a Friday night anyway. And I was like, well, thanks a lot, guy. So, um, so, so yeah, so she uh, uh, gracefully agreed to step aside and she joined us tonight, which is a lot better than the last time this worked out. Because some of you know, for Astronomy Day 2010, I tried to contact Story Musgrave, and he took forever to get back to me. So I moved on to somebody else and bumped him when Story finally got back to me. And I and I invited that guy to give a general meeting talk like I did for Dr. Leppo tonight, and I never heard from that guy again. So uh, he, he apparently held the grudge, but Dr. Leppo did not, and I really, really appreciate it. it that was a, it was a great talk, and it was a pleasure having you. And uh, maybe we'll check in with you in uh, maybe five years and see, see what the latest from Webb is. Oh, yeah. We'll have a lot more science to talk about. Absolutely. So, thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you for joining us. You're certainly welcome to stay, but we are going to go ahead and move on to the rest of the meeting. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. So let's jump right into the uh, president's report. No snack break. Although, of course, if you have a snack, uh, feel free to indulge yourself. Just make sure you mute the microphone because we don't want to hear it. Uh, who brought the snacks tonight? I, I don't see any. Oh, well, never mind. They're, they're in your kitchen, Joe. Okay. Okay. So let's start with the uh, introduction of 2023 KS board members, because uh, we do have uh, one brand new board member, but uh, everyone else has been on the board uh, before. Uh, so for those of you that maybe don't know, if you're really, really new to the club, uh, my name is Richard Bell. I am uh, now the 18-time president of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Yes, my presidency is now old enough to join the military or uh, vote or something like that. So that's cool. And um, I've been a member of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society since December of 1994. But I did start attending meetings a little before that when I worked at the planetarium with Eric here. And our uh, returning vice president is Jack Price. I don't know if 
You wanted to say any words, Jack? You don't have to. Nope, doesn't look like he wants to. And our treasurer is uh, Don Stillwell, the, the guy that uh, is growing the winter beard as he does every season. You can tell the seasons by his beard there. There he is. And our uh, returning secretary, Alcor, is Aaron Roman. So um, if, if you complete a Astronomical League observing program, you would send it to Aaron. He's uh, here somewhere, although we have so many people sharing screens, I, I can't find anybody. And then our, our, our brand new uh, publicity manager is Jeremiah Poole. I think that's uh, Jer Poole there. There he is uh, waving. And uh, so he's uh, the newest member of the board. Uh, he's been on the board an entire six days now. And, and we haven't met yet, so we haven't scared him off. But as soon as we meet, he'll be thinking, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> okay. And then we have our members at large. Um, Anna Daly, I believe this is her second term on the board. So hello, Anna. And we have, uh, I think he's here, Scott McFarlane is on the board. And we have um, Dave Garden. I know I went on a little bit out of alphabetic order there. Dave's been on the board uh, on and off for quite a while. He was on the board in the 90s, and they just uh, joined us again a few years ago. And then we have uh, Dave Wolf. I don't believe Dave joined us tonight. but yep, Dave, I'm here. Oh, oh Dave Wolf is there. He's just all gray. Hey, everybody. So Dave Wolf is back on the board after a little hiatus there. So those are the board members, and you'll get to see them in person at other general meetings or maybe astrophoto SIG meetings or observing sessions. So if you have any complaints about me, just keep it to yourself. Don't, don't bring mm. it to them. I got a list. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone does. All right. Uh, so I also wanted to mention, as I did last month, uh, be sure you go to the KAS Schedule of Events webpage. I, I probably should have threw in a bookmark uh, or a, a link for that. Let me do that real quick here because I have a bunch of other links to uh, post in here if I can find them. So here is the schedule of events webpage. I'll just throw the link in there. And um, be sure you go through the schedule page. Uh, not every activity this year is on there yet, but you can go through each activity and add them to your calendar, uh, you know, your electronic calendar, or you can write them down the old fashioned way and make sure uh, your calendar reminds you of upcoming activities if you don't pay attention to the emails that I sent out. You know, we, we pay for that service where we, you know, that calendar service. So we like to get the maximum, uh, you know, return for our investment. So be sure you actually use it and add stuff to your calendar so you don't miss any activities uh, this year. And again, like last month, I wanted to uh, remind everyone uh, that pretty soon here, I'm gonna start uh, working out a schedule for uh, uh, general meetings in late 2023 and especially early 2024, because we're, we're gonna have nothing but eclipse talks coming up uh, ahead of the April 8th, 2024 total solar eclipse. So if there's a specific speaker you might really like to hear from, like maybe somebody wrote a book recently that you think we should invite, you know, the author, you know, let me know. So I, I am definitely looking for ideas for potential eclipse speakers. Obviously, I have some people in mind, but it's always good to hear from the membership to, uh, to know what ideas you might have. And we're going to try to plan all kinds of other Eclipse uh, uh, programming. Uh, we're going to have astrophotography workshops. Uh, I'm thinking either I might find someone to do it or I'll just do it myself and do a uh, you know, at least a two-part series on taking pictures of the Eclipse and then maybe even a standalone workshop on using Eclipse Orchestrator, although I'll have to remind myself how to use the Eclipse Orchestrator because I haven't used it since 2017 because I haven't seen the Eclipses since then, so it hasn't been uh, a, a high priority. And we still have some solar filter material leftover from the 2017 eclipse that Don donated, and we'll probably do another solar filter workshop. So if you wanna make a solar filter for your small telescope or binoculars or camera lenses, don't expect to bring like a, a 10 inch uh, Schmidt and say, hey, can I make a full aperture solar filter? And no, but maybe an off axis one, that might be okay, but uh, you have to keep it small. So yeah, so there's lots of stuff coming up.
What was there a comment? Was that Don? It, yeah, about like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no bigger than eighty millimeter, I think. Yeah. Right. And uh, next, um, I'll be uh, doing the third member renewal notice. Uh, soon, this time, I might mail out hard copy stuff because I know there are some people that just really only respond to getting stuff in the mail the old-fashioned way. And uh, I'm not sure I want to do that because the club is a lot bigger than it used to be. Uh, so there are still quite a few people that need to renew, and I hope they do. Uh, so that's a lot of envelopes to stuff, and I'm, I'm not sure I want to do it right away. So I might, I might do another email or I just might send everyone a hard copy letter. I, I, I know one person in particular that will only renew if I send him uh, something in the mail. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of anxious to maybe get that done. So I know uh, Sinclair has to renew. Um, I briefly looked through the list today. I know uh, Frank Severance, I'm, I think you're still here. You need to renew. So, uh, yep, there you are. And uh, so many of you need to get on the ball. Uh, again, if you haven't done so, go to the member roster page. If it says 2022 in, the, the, in your row, that means you have to renew. So let's get this done because as soon as I can get memberships done, we can move on to the other, other exciting things. Or maybe I could do some stuff for me for a change instead of for the club. So let's renew and get this done. Uh, now the bad news is the remote telescope is broken. It is offline. We missed a little bit around uh, uh, Christmas. It was really good out there around Christmas time, very clear skies. Uh, but for the past couple of weeks, we frankly haven't missed anything because it's been pretty cloudy out there. Uh, as it usually is toward the end of December and January. Uh, so the problem is with the uh, MKS 5000 circuit board, uh, the USB port that allows us to connect to the telescope uh, uh, basically came loose. And we had a, a very quick board meeting on December 21st and agreed to buy another one, but that's $1,500 freaking dollars. And they're on back order because of the chip shortage. So we don't know when we'll be able to get another circuit board. So uh, what we're trying to do now is get the current board repaired. Um, and so the issue is the size, is the soldering joints or the points are very, very small and, and, and no one quite had the uh, uh, toolkit to uh, do the job. So I had an idea and uh, uh, member Kevin Jung had the same idea. Why not contact a fellow KAS member and owner of Optech in Lowell, Michigan, Jeff Dickerman. And so I did, and he agreed uh, to take a look at it. So it's currently in the mail and it's supposed to be delivered at Optech on Monday. And he doesn't think his people will have any trouble resoldering the USB port. And uh, he'll uh, hopefully mail it back as soon as possible. I don't expect him to get it in the next uh, day or two. But uh, that means the uh, the online viewing session on January 14th is in jeopardy. We, we will probably very likely have to cancel. I haven't pulled the plug yet because there's a slim chance we could get the board back in time. But I, I might have to ask him to maybe send it by second day air. And we'll, of course, we'll reimburse them or something if we can, if we're in that big a hurry to uh, get it back. And we already had our first cancellation. And, um, but fortunately the weather kind of bailed us out because for the first time the weather was bad enough to where we couldn't hold a session on either day. So, uh, so that kind of ruins our perfect record, but oh well. And finally, um, those of you that attended uh, the meeting last month, our annual meeting and winter solstice uh, dinner party uh, knows that uh, a member of another club, uh, but, uh, very talented observer named GM Ross, who's a member of the Grand Rapids Club and the Warren Club, uh, volunteered to give a talk to us on the history of astrology. And we uh, quite rightly said no. <laughs> and uh, so he wasn't too happy about that and wrote something not terribly flattering in their newsletter. So I wrote a response and it was published in their newsletter. And if you want to see it, there's the link to the Warren Club newsletter, and uh, just go to, um, I'll type it in here, go to page nine. 
There we go. So if you're curious and you want to read my response and also see the picture that I took of people holding up the signs that said astrology is a fraud, you can check that out and see yourself, uh, hopefully in the crowd, doing the old thumbs down thing. I'm sure Ross will have a response to our response, but for me, it's done. I'm going to ignore them and let it go. So I'm done with that. So that is it for the president's report. Let's go ahead and move on to observing reports. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, so obviously, uh, not too many local people have done observing. Maybe some of our out-of-state members can rub it in how clear your skies have been. Uh, but if you don't have any observing reports, or if you have uh, something you got for uh, Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever, if you got a gift, that will allow you to observe when skies are clear, maybe you can share that instead of an observing report. So anyone have any observing reports or observing gifts to share? Well, I did try to see Mercury. I'm always talking about Mercury. Um, one of those days in late December when it got clear, it sort of, um, I didn't see it. I did see Venus though. Uh, you know, <laughs> so that, that's that's all I've got. I was going to mention, I think it was a, a day or two after Christmas. I was walking out to the driveway at night and did see the uh, crescent moon near Jupiter. It, they were probably eight something degrees apart. They weren't terribly close, but it was still a nice sight. And that was the first time I saw the sky in quite a while. So anybody else have any observing reports or getting... Hi, Richard. This is uh, Richard in Arizona. Um, I got a, a new Dobsonian uh, for Christmas and I had a great Christmas Eve viewing. And since then, it's been completely clouded over. Well, that's the new telescope curse. How, mm -hmm. how, how big is your dab? Oh, just, just a 10 inch. Well, 10, 10 inches is pretty good. Good. That's at least three months of clouds here. I don't know. I don't know how bad it is in Arizona, but for here, that's three months solid for us. And I, I know. Mention, oh yeah, go Richard, ahead, Mike. I should mention that on uh, Wood TV tonight, they had a guy who was talking, a meteorologist, who was talking about in the last sixty-six days, we've had twenty-seven days of complete cloud cover, and we have we'd have uh, another thirty-two days of fifty percent or more cloud cover. So. You don't get to see the sky when it's cloudy, period. Not Mitchell. often. Not often. The, the best December observing session I can ever remember was in 1998. It was like 50, 55 degrees, and the Geminids were awesome that night. And I was at the Nature Center all by myself. But yeah, that, that does not happen very often, where it's actually clear and warm in December. Never in January. And I know uh, uh, Kevin probably won't share, but uh, uh, Kevin Jung is with us. He's probably going to be very quiet. I know he got a new telescope for himself. He bought a small, uh, like, uh, 60, 70 millimeter William Optics uh, refractor. We're looking forward to seeing that someday. I did see a picture of it. Looks like a sweet little telescope. So congrats to Kevin. That's only like uh, uh, six weeks of cloudy, cloudy skies. All right, so moving on, how about uh, astronomical news and events? Anybody have any news to share? Uh, there's a comet coming that might be end up being visible to the naked eye. It has the very catchy name C2022E3ZTF. Uh, so, you know, just remember that. But it's supposed to be closest to the Earth, um, I think, February 12th. So it might it might be naked eye. Yeah, it won't be naked eye for us. <laughs> but yeah, I've seen some sweet pictures of that comet online, and I was hoping to get some pictures of it with the twenty inch out west. But you know, by the time we get it fixed, it might be gone. But who knows? Yeah. So there's the comet. Um, of course, we mentioned this was going to happen at the last meeting, but then it did happen. 
Uh, the Orion spacecraft did splash down successfully on December 11th. So that mission went, I think, pretty much flawlessly. I don't think they had any major issues with the rocket or the spacecraft or anything. So that's really good. Uh, the, the Mars InSight mission has ended. Uh, the thing finally got choked out by too much dust, cut, cut light off from the solar panels, and the battery basically died. So they last heard from the lander on December 15th and finally decided to pull the plug on December 29th. Uh, but from what Kevin told me from um, our, our friend, uh, whose name is blanking on my head right now, uh, Kevin could probably chime in here if he's still awake. But uh, they're going to try to say something. Yeah, <laughs> Jim, uh, James Ashley at JPL. Yes. yes. So Jim was telling Kevin, Kevin, do you, do you just want to tell us? <clears throat> well, they've, uh, they're still going to, they gave the Insight team enough funds that they're actually going to listen for another four years. Uh, they, one of the reasons they picked the landing site for Insight is because it's, in a high concentration of where they do have a lot of dust devils. And it's just been kind of unlucky that they haven't been hit by one, but they're hoping in the next few years to get hit by one. And if it cleans off the solar panels good enough, Mars Odyssey is going to be listening for signals. And if InSight wakes up and talks to Odyssey, they could possibly start up and do some more observations. All depends on if they get the solar panels cleaned. All right, thank you, Kevin. And the last thing that I had uh, note of are some notable deaths recently in the astronomical community. Uh, we lost Akira Fuji on December 28th at the age of 81. For those of you that don't know Akira Fuji, he hasn't been really prominent in the past, I don't know, 10 plus years or so. Uh, but during the 90s, he was very well known uh, for his film constellation pictures. Uh, he was quite, quite famous as a constellation or nightscape photographer. I remember, I think it was in the old museum gift shop where, where I worked for a while. Uh, we had this book from Akira Fuji of, you know, constellation pictures with these, you know, uh, transparent overlays to show you the, you know, stick figures and stuff like that. And I really wish I got that book, but I never did. And uh, maybe, maybe I should look for a used copy um, on like uh, Amazon right now. And on January 3rd, we lost uh, Walter Cunningham at the age of 90. And he was the last surviving Apollo 7 astronaut. So we've lost uh, Apollo 7 now. So there aren't too many Apollo astronauts left. Any other news? I know we just got done with the holiday season, so there's not a whole lot going on right now. But I think we pretty much covered the bases and hope we do have clear skies uh, to see that comet. But, you know, I'm trying not to get my hopes up. Okay, oh, so let's... You, yes, yes, go um, ahead, Kevin. Did anybody bring up... Um, I know we talked about Mar the Mars uh, occultation, but uh, <laughs> there's going to be a close almost occultation at the end of this month too right for those of you down in florida uh you might get to see it but yeah not, not us yeah mars is going to go just just to the north of the moon yeah on the 31st the sun's become very active with the large sunspot coming into view too hopefully we'll get some nice northern lights with maybe a clear night if we're yeah. lucky I haven't been checking it every night, but I always check during the winter, especially. I check the um, the uh, uh, Churchill uh, webcam up in Churchill, Manitoba, Canada, and uh, it's, it's been pretty cl it's been pretty cloudy up there. It doesn't start to clear up up there until at least February or March, or for Eric when he, when he's there. Not at all. <laughs> Poor Eric. Travel all the way up there. It was cloudy the whole week. Okay, so moving on, let's uh, go through the event horizon real quick. So I already mentioned the online viewing session scheduled for uh, January 14th with a cloud date of the 15th. Odds are we'll have to cancel the entire thing because the telescope is currently down. And um, speaking of which, by the way, I forgot to mention, um, probably a bad time to do it, but uh, our 
our remote telescope fund is getting pretty low. So if anyone's looking for any, you know, tax de uh, deductions going into tax season here, now would be a great time to make a nice, generous donation to the remote telescope and uh, help help us replenish the uh, maintenance fund. So I thought I'd just mention that real quick. There is a observing SIG scheduled for uh, January 19th. I did look ahead to the calendar and it looks like it's going to be cloudy and rainy, but uh, Aaron, I don't know if you guys had any backup plan to talk about observing on Zoom or anything, but uh, if not, I guess we'll just have to uh, chalk it up to another cancellation. Nope, just chalk it up to cancellation if we get there, but you never know. Yeah, you never know. Weather. It could, it, it's far enough away. It, the, the forecast could change. Uh, oh, I was going to... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slacking off here. I was going to paste this. Of course, I shouldn't even bother with this one. But uh, here is the link to register for the uh, uh, January 14th online viewing session that will probably cancel. Uh, but you can go ahead and register and see what happens. And then, oh boy, uh, am I excited. This is going to be great. On uh, Friday, January 20th, we have our next meeting of... Oh, that only went to Mike Sinclair because he uh, because he sent you a private message. Yeah, you sent me a private message, so that so for some reason that goes to you. So there's the online viewing session thing again. Mike messed everything up. Nice going, Mike. And here's the You're link. <laughs> here's the link to register for the astrophotography SIG meeting on January twentieth, and you definitely want to attend that one. Um, it, you know, it, it, it'll probably geared toward a little bit toward imaging the sun, um, which is great. And you could do it because we have everything you need in our observatory. But our very special guest speaker will be world-renowned Canadian amateur astronomer Jack Newton, who's the uh, founder also of Arizona Sky Village, the home of the remote telescope. So you will definitely get a reminder email about this if you are a member. So uh, if you like astrophotography or not, be sure to attend the January Astrophoto SIG meeting. That'll start at 8 p.m. on January 20th because, you know, uh, we, we do have a very, very special guest and that will be via Zoom as well. I figured we'll just meet uh, via Zoom uh, for the entire month of January because he, he'll obviously be joining us uh, via Zoom. And then we have another, here we go, uh, online viewing session on January 28th with a cloud date of January 29th. And uh, hopefully we'll have the telescope working by then. So there's plenty of stuff that you can register for that we have coming up just this month alone. Real quick, uh, prime focus, the deadline is the 15th of every month. So that means for this month, the deadline for the February newsletter is January 15th. So if you have something timely to go in, like a you know night sky event that takes place in February, you got to try to get it to me by January uh, 15th. But if it's not timely, just send it to me when you can, and it'll get in the newsletter eventually. And other business. Two other things I wanted to mention. I, I mentioned it in the email that I sent out this morning, but uh, there are two uh, uh, notable updates to the website. There's the first one is I have updated the um, January. Oh, well, that's the wrong one. Oh, hang on. That's for the February meeting. I'm getting my uh, cut and paste mixed up here. Here it is. <laughs> I have up. Uh, no, that's not it either. Holy crap, I keep selecting the wrong one. I, I can't speed read anymore. I'm getting too old. Okay, well, there's plenty there. Here we go. There it is. So I've updated the general meeting gallery. Uh, of course, I decided to combine three years because, you know, I, I don't share too many images from Zoom meetings because that would be pretty boring. Uh, so, so I basically collected all the in-person activities that we had over the past three years and put them into one gallery this time. And so that's why we have a 2020 to 2022 general meeting gallery now. And I have also updated the observing se session gallery and I will make sure to select the right one. So of course, if you're watching this on YouTube uh, recorded, uh, just go to our website, uh, look for the gallery link, 
and look for the general meeting gallery and the observing session gallery. But if you have not checked out the new general meeting and observing session gallery, please do because that is a chore uh, to put together. So uh, please appreciate my hard work for you folks, the KAS membership. Both of those look really nice, Richard. Thank you for doing your work. Thank you, Jack. All right, does anyone else have any other items to mention, astronomically speaking? All right, and finally, for my last bit of business, I just want to nominate Mike Sinclair for Speaker of the House. Is it going to take 15 votes to get there? <laughs> yes. So while we have Mike, well, uh, oh, shoot, he already muted himself, but he can unmute himself pretty quick here. Our next month's speaker, I already posted the uh, registration link for it, but let me do it one more time so it's a little more relevant is there is the registration link for the uh, meeting. But of course, we're going to be back at Camsey next month. So if you plan to join us at Camsey, uh, there's no need to register. But if you're, uh, if you're still leery about attending in person or just live too far away, uh, be sure to register and join us. On, oh, dang it. For some reason, that went to Kim directly. Please don't directly chat me because it screws up to who it goes to. Okay, so <laughs> so there's the uh, registration link for the February meeting. And our guest speaker is none other than Mike Sinclair, the next speaker of the house. And Mike, you want to give us a uh, preview of your talk? Sure. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, general relativity since it's uh, brought up quite a bit over the course of the last few years. I'm going to give you a pretty... Uh, basic and simplified view of it so that we have some sense of what uh, GR is all about. And uh, yes, there will be equations and there will be a quiz afterwards. All right. I like and I almost, I almost have my PowerPoint done. I like the title of the talk, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. I found it a little insulting. I, I am not unenlightened. <laughs> Although you're, you're, well, it's for those who are relatively unlightened. People who are enlightened, they don't, it's just, you know, a rehash of GR. So, <laughs> All right. So that's going to be a fantastic talk for those of you that are still relatively new. You've never seen Sinclair give a talk before. You do not want to miss it. So join us at Camsey. Join us on Zoom. And uh, yes, you can watch the recording later on YouTube, but recordings on YouTube do nothing for me. What makes this worthwhile is seeing people show up to these events. We are not a YouTube uh, uh, channel or, you know, some YouTuber. We want to see people in person. But if you have to join us via Zoom, uh, then, then that's great, too. Can we, so, can we, can we ring it so that he, we can photobomb him? Yeah, Absolutely. Sure. Okay. I've got a I'll have a taser with me, but you can photobomb me all you want. Okay. <laughs> oh, and Joe, I, I'm glad you spoke up. Do you want to do snacks for February since you didn't since you couldn't do them for yeah, January? January. Let, uh, let me jot that down. Let me put it in my calendar, or I'll forget. So snacks okay. for the February meeting. All right. Sna That's snacks good. for the February meeting. That's because I brought it up earlier, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. All right. So I think that concludes our evening. I want to thank everyone for joining us for the January 2023 general meeting. We'll see you next time.